Today's date is July 1st, 2009. Uh, the survivor is Jerry Rawicki. The interviewer is Carolyn Ellis. We are in St. Petersburg, Florida in the United States. The language is English and the videographer is Jane Duncan. My name is Carolyn Ellis. Today's date is July 1st, 2009. I am conducting an interview with Jerry Rawicki. The interview is being conducted in St. Petersburg, Florida, United States. And now uh, Jerry is going to read the statement on the release form. I, Jerry Rowicki, acknowledge and agree that my oral testimony may be used by the Florida Holocaust Museum for all standard museum purposes. The museum may use this interview, including my name, photograph, videotyped image, and related written materials. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And now we're going to start with you just telling us your name and spelling it for us. My name is Jerry Rowicki, J-E-R-R-Y-R-A-W-I-C-K-I. And the date of your birth? April 30th, 1927. And your age at this moment? 82. Okay. And the city and country where you were born? I was born in Poland in a city of Płock. And could uh, you spell that for us? It was P-L-O-C-K. Okay, thank you. Now I just want to start with your childhood and if you could give us a sense of just what that was like. My childhood was very wonderful. I remember a very loving parents sisters, friends, uh, relatives. Uh, we lived in a very beautiful town, uh, an old town, date, dating a oh, thousand years back to the time when Poland embraced Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very picturesque town. I remember playing uh, with my friends uh, with abandon and youthful enthusiasm, but that, of course, I don't want to sound like I'm waxing sentimental about the uh, uh, place, because what I remember, unfortunately, most about it, it's when I became almost an adult and uh, the war broke out and that erased all these beautiful memories of my childhood. Okay. okay. That's okay. Can, can we see if we can go back and capture a few of those memories? These good memories you The good about? memories, yes. Like who were your friends? Were, were they mainly Jewish kids or? No, no. Oh, As a okay. matter of fact, uh, I went to a, per, um, a Catholic school. Mm -hmm. Now that wasn't because uh, of my religious, you know, affiliation. I was a Jew practicing. Well, we were uh, assimilated, mm -hmm. my family and I, as quite a few people in, in Portsk were Jews. But uh, the better schools were private schools. Not that we could afford it, I don't think we could, but for some reason both my sisters attended that uh, Catholic school and I sort of, uh, on the basis of their good grades, and good behavior, I pursued the studies over there. Okay. And uh, it was a very wonderful school. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there were in our class there were three or four Jewish kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a Catholic school, but very progressive for that particular uh, era. What I remember was that Whenever, I say progressive because that school allowed us, Jewish children, to have a rabbi come in uh, once a week mm -hmm. when the, other, uh, when the rest of the class had catechism, mm -hmm. we were leaving the room and we had a special other room where the rabbi or assistant rabbi uh, had us for an hour. And what I remember, to my chagrin of course, that uh, 
we hated that particular day mm -hmm. because our friends, um, Paul, Arian, uh, you know, Catholics, whom, with whom we played, mm -hmm. with whom we interacted, whose houses we were invited to, when that happened, when we were, the, our exodus from the class was met with what I would call anti-Semitic slurs. Okay. And it was so, it was embarrassing, that's why we hated it. It wasn't maybe, because they were kids our age, and there was nothing, uh, the anger was probably a product of the anti-Semitism that was evident in Poland for years, for, for centuries. Mm -hmm. And they didn't mean to maybe uh, cause us any harm or maybe embarrassment. But they were saying, oh, a Jew killer, a Christ killer, something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Almost in jest. Mm -hmm. Some of them maybe, they, they mean in jest, but it was very, very painful, that particular mm -hmm. thing. But other than that, it was a very, we had very, very good, uh, I have very good memories. Uh, I was, for example, participating in plays, mm -hmm. uh, Christmas plays, for example. As a matter of fact, I have a, a picture I brought with me that it shows me in a class, and there is a uh, faculty, and there's a priest in it and all that. So uh, it was very, very nice mm -hmm. overall. Were you a good student? I was a very good student, and that's what kept me in school, because uh, I hope you don't want to ask me whether I was a prankster. <laughs> I, uh, there was, I don't know whether this has anything to do with this interview, but I'll tell you, in that school, and I think in all schools in Poland at the time, we had what we call a black book. Everybody was issued a black book, and that book was a means of communication of the teachers with the parent. So if somebody did something, you know, that was not, not acceptable, the teacher would write, you know, this mm -hmm. black book, and the parent had to sign it. Mm -hmm. Now with my sisters and, and with others, that book was never used for a whole year. Mine was full at the end of the semester. <laughs> and I was accused of other things, you know, that it was a vendetta, you know, against me. Uh -huh. But I had good grades, and that's why I wasn't expelled. Okay, all right. Did you feel anti-Semitism any other time other than when you went to be with the rabbi? Not as a child, not mm -hmm. until maybe when I was, well, 11, 12 years old, mm -hmm. when uh, the uh, sort of, uh, when we knew that the world was coming, mm -hmm. and the anti-Semitism, which was latent in Poland, you know, it was hidden, it was, uh, of course, we ch as children we didn't realize it, but there was a rise of anti-Semitism right in 1938, mm -hmm. 39, mm -hmm. And uh, it wasn't directed at me as a child, but mm -hmm. as Jews on the whole. Mm -hmm. What was, uh, th this thing was heightened, that feeling of anti-Semitism and the foreboding of what was, hap was going to have for, uh, happening for us, was that my grandparents, who lived in Germany, mm -hmm. in Hamburg, in a suburb of Hamburg, Altoona, were, uh, displaced, we were uh, take, uh, you know, ordered to live, uh, to leave Germany, and they came to live with us. Okay. And for the first time, of course, we heard, you know, first-person accounts of what was happening in Germany. Although we didn't have to, because my father was listening constantly. He was a, like I'm today. He was a news junkie. Mm -hmm. And he was constantly listening to a radio. Mm -hmm. He bought, as a matter of fact, the most expensive at that time radio, which was always a, a point of contention between my mother and him. He says, why did you spend money on this? We, we could use the money for other reasons. Mm -hmm. But it was a very latest uh, German radio telephone can, 
and I remember there was a magic eye that, you know, when the voice was fluctuating, the, it was fascinating for no other reason for me than for that. And uh, so he could listen, to, he would listen every, uh, every evening to the harangues by Hitler or Goebbels or these other, you know, Nazi big shots. And uh, he understood, he, of course, my f father was bilingual, he knew German and he would translate it to us. Mm -hmm. And there was another point of contention between my mother and father, because she says, why do you listen to him? Mm -hmm. when said, These are guys, they're just blowhards. Mm -hmm. I would know Germany. Mm -hmm. She was in Germany as a young kid, she used to be, uh, and she was so impressed by the German culture, by the beauty of Alps and the, uh, um, music festivals and uh, you know the universities where she was visiting with her adoptive parents. She was an orphan she, and she was adopted by a very rich family so they traveled and she says oh it couldn't be it couldn't be like that you know my, my f and she was contradicting mm -hmm. what my father was listening to mm -hmm. and so then of course to answer your question this was where I started to feel Jewish, and I, I felt the sting of anti-Semitism because up to then, I was just a Polish kid. You mm -hmm. know, I was. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so. let's talk about your family a little bit. Like, so who who lived in the house with you? Well, we had a, it was my parents and two sisters. Mm -hmm. uh, we were um, economically. Um, maybe middle class, lower middle class. My father was a, um, uh, he, he was a, by trade, he was a, uh, a printer, but he was uh, in management. Uh, he was mm -hmm. working uh, for a industrial uh, factory. Mm -hmm. They were making uh, machinery and uh, tools, agricultural tools and machinery. Okay. And, uh, and could you say his name for us? My father's name was Abraham Rowicki, okay. Abraham. Mm -hmm. My uh, mother's name was Sophie. Uh, and her my maiden si name was, her maiden name? Her, ma her name, maiden name was Finkelstein. Mm -hmm. uh, and my sister's name was, one, one was Stephanie, who was four years older than I was. Uh, was and uh, Felicia mm -hmm. Fila was seven years older. Okay. She's the one who survived the war and she lives in Israel now. Okay. All right. So back to you. your father was a printer. He, he was, he never practiced printing, I guess, because uh, he was, um, he was working for this uh, outfit that the owners of that outfit adopted my, the, the parents of the owners of the outfit adopted my mother when she was orphaned, maybe she was one or two years old. And uh, she was, uh, uh, when she became of age and my father married her, he was he got the job in the factory, yes. so to speak. Yes. And was your mother German or was she Polish? Oh, no, Polish? no. My was mother Polish. was Jewish, Polish. Okay. Yeah. Okay. They're, they're all Polish Jews, yes. Okay. All right, everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so this was the, as far as the family was concerned, we were, um, religiously speaking, we were uh, assimilated. Mm -hmm. We were, uh, we consider ourselves Poles, but by assimilation it doesn't mean that we abandoned our Jewish heritage. Mm -hmm. We were, our parents uh, were uh, observing the uh, Jewish high holidays mm -hmm. and we our children were told to go to the synagogue with them, mm -hmm. which sometimes didn't sit well with us, but we had to acquiesce. And uh, so, uh, so now I told you about our religious, uh, you know, situation, mm -hmm. our economic, 
Um, did your mother work ever outside the home? No, no, my mother okay. didn't. Okay. She, she was um, she was not very well. I remember. So, I mean, she was very tiny. Mm -hmm. she, her hair was. Uh, I'm told, of course. I, we always remember her as, as having gray hair, and I was told that she uh, was gray. Uh, her hair was gray when she was a, almost a teenager, or something like this. Mm -hmm. So, and she had varicose veins. I remember. Okay. At that time, of course, as you know, the medical uh, situation wasn't as good as now. So she suffered with it, and uh, she was frail, but uh, very energetic. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, sometimes okay. too energetic. <laughs> when we got those, when she got that black book back, I can still, <laughs> I was, oh, I, I was just shaking because I can still feel the sting of her, uh, you know, uh, hand on my face, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Corporal punishment like this was common, you know. Mm -hmm. So I was crying even before I gave her the book. <laughs> <laughs> but this was... Uh, So that's how I remember my mother, mm -hmm. and uh, other than that, as I say, we we didn't um, uh, particular we didn't have any luxuries that we that I can talk talk about, but we had a very very good um, uh, youthful life, mm -hmm. and a very loving family and. Culturally, we were very uh, lucky because both my parents uh, loved m liked music. Uh, we, our uh, house was always full of uh, a record. A record. Uh, we had a record player. This old thing mm -hmm. that you see sometimes mm -hmm. in the advertisements of RCA, and uh, we had um, uh, records. My father had a very good voice, and he was singing all these uh, uh, songs that were number one at the time, mm -hmm. and everything was popular. He also uh, listened to opera, to, uh, to concerts and things like that. Uh, so in that respect, we were very, very uh, lucky. We had a small uh, library, you know, we had books. Uh, that sometimes I was looking at, I was supposed to, again, I would be punished severely <laughs> because I found books that were my sisters were supposed to read and my parents, and uh, I sneaked in and I saw that, you know. So why weren't you supposed to read them? Well, because... Uh, this is have like uh, vita sexualis for oh, example okay uh, it right. wasn't for me <laughs> right you were too young i was too young but I, I i heard that it was good so <laughs> so i looked at it so i there were other books you know that i uh, i remember uh, at a time where we were um the day the night that we were expelled from our town i was in the middle of a book and I remember I, I was reading it, and it was very interesting. And I took it with me. And uh, as I were walking, as we were walking down the staircase, we were on the third floor of our apartment. Uh, on each landing, there was a German soldier, and he hit the book, you know, out of my hand. I finished the book three or four years later after I was in the United States. Mm -hmm. It was The Citadel by Cronin. Mm -hmm. So uh, um, so we had, um, our cultural life was, you know, on, on a par with whatever other people did in this town. Mm -hmm. The town, incidentally, was, uh, for a small town, it was about 40, uh, 
thousand inhabitants. Okay. We had good schools. We had uh, excellent schools. Uh, we had uh, a theological seminary, which was very famous in Poland. Mm -hmm. We had a cloister or a mon monastery that produced, you know, uh, theologians. Uh, so we were very lucky in that respect. Mm -hmm. So the time was the town was very cultural, historical, yeah. and a uh, nice place to live. Okay. And one last question. Did your parents emphasize your Jewish identity other than going for, uh, to high holidays? That was just about the extent of it, I mm -hmm. think, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, for, you know, I was, in 1939, uh, I was preparing for my bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, I had a special tutor. Yes. Uh, uh, like an assistant rabbi would come to the house, and uh, uh, at one, as a matter of fact, excuse me, at one point I was going to a religious parochial school once okay. a week to learn. But again, <laughs> they thought better I, I do it, you know, at, at home. So you so, didn't take Hebrew classes or anything? No, just, uh, I did, you know, just for the, for the, for the bar mitzvah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All right, now, can you remember a point at which this all changed? Well, that, that changed when, uh, came to an abrupt halt, when the Germans, of course, invaded Poland in September of 1939. Mm -hmm. The first thing that, uh, really affected us uh, is I mentioned to you that uh, my father had a m mid level management pos position. His assistant or maybe co worker was a gentleman by the name of Gross. He was a ethnic German. Mm -hmm. And in our town there were quite a few ethnic Germans. Doesn't matter there was a Lutheran church or Lutheran or Protestant church. And uh, he happened to be an ethnic German, and I remember him uh, when I was five, six years old. I would sometimes uh, come to my uh, uh, father's office, and he was there. and And I remember th the desks were facing each other. My father was on one desk, and he was, uh, and he would take me on his lap, Mr. Gross, that ethnic German, and uh, he. I loved the way he played with me. He let me play with the things with the abacus, mm -hmm. you know, at that time mm -hmm. this was how mm -hmm. we were computing things, and uh, with, the, with the paper uh, punch, uh, uh, what a Hole puncher? Uh, yeah, hole puncher, mm -hmm. and when the Germans came in, my mother, uh, my father had to leave suddenly. It developed that this Mr. Gross, who's supposed to be our best friend, uh, conspired. He says that my father, you know, did something sabotage, you know, and my father was just about to be arrested, so he left for Warsaw. So we were uh, left alone, my mother and my um, my two sisters. So this was the first shock, so to speak. Uh, at the same, talk about this, Mr. Gross. Before that happened, uh, in the first few weeks, the Germans, of course declared that Jews could not have many, many things, among them furs. Mm -hmm. Now, I mentioned to you that we weren't very rich, but we had furs. Mm -hmm. My mother's two brothers were furriers in London, oh. so they would send her most expensive, well, at that time, you know, uh, mink, uh, seals, and all kinds of mm -hmm. things. I remember caracols, there was a, there was a name for that. And when this decree told us that the Jews cannot have furs. Naturally, we stored them at Mr. Gross's and his wife, hoping that after the war we'll get it. But that was it. So, uh, so this was the first shock. Then, of course, the restrictions. You know, the uh, occupation was becoming more and more difficult. There were restrictions. There were proclamations. There were. Uh, uh, then, of course, the most important thing is, we happened to live in a Jewish section of town, but Jews who did not live in the particular sections were told 
that they had to move to the Jewish section. So naturally, the crowd, we, every Jewish family had to accept at least one f other family, mm -hmm. usually neighbors or possibly um, relatives. Mm -hmm. And we did, I, don't, I remember one family that we uh, uh, accepted, and it was, we were crowded, and of course, we were completely out of our normal rhythm, as to mm -hmm. speak, mm -hmm. so to speak. But um, these were the things, but they were still nothing compared to what uh, came later. Right now, the Germans were, we were in a, what, what I call phase one of the German extermination, which was designed to make us uh, completely uh, out of our way of life, okay. uh, made us so uncertain what was coming. We didn't know whether we were coming or going. Mm -hmm. The Germans were the uh, proclamations and these all kinds of restrictions were coming fast and furious. Mm -hmm. Not as much, I think, to make us think, but to make us confused. Mm -hmm. So today, for example, the, 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 the printers over there must have had a mint, we must be making a mint, because in the morning there, was a, there were posters plastered all over the place that we were supposed, for example, uh, that the curfew was at 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Three months, uh, three hours later, there were posters claiming no, it wasn't five, it was 4.30, mm -hmm. something like that, mm -hmm. just to confuse us. Mm -hmm. But this was still nothing that we really worried that much, at least we as children. But then, of course, um, came the uh, deportation, which I mentioned to you, you know, the day that you know I was reading the, uh, the Citadel, and uh, we were. May I use this for a second? Please, yes. Yeah. We were told to uh, take. I was going to say all our belongings, the belongings that we the belongings that we would carry with us, and get in front of the uh, um, houses to wait to be transported, mm -hmm. where we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were waiting in a drizzling rain. This was right after midnight. And I don't think that the flatbed trucks came for us uh, until maybe dawn. So we were standing there in this freezing rain. Uh, one of the things that, again, it's difficult for me to even talk about it, but I'll try to reconstructed, the, the street that we lived on was called Broad Street. It broad? Was broad Street. Mm -hmm. And it was broad. There was a strip of uh, a lawn, uh, greenery in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. And we were standing and waiting. They were waiting for these things. It was freezing. And the Germans were, of course, patrolling the thing. And right across the street, there was a, a good friend of mine li lived. And I, all of a sudden, I decided, you know, I was bored with this. My mother was there and all that. And I said, oh, I will, I'll see my friend. Mm -hmm. And I thought I would run over and my, I was arguing about my, with my mother about other things, you know, we were, but then I said, okay, I'll see him. And my mother right away says, come back. And as she yelled, I also heard the German say in German. That time I didn't know it. You know, I knew that he wanted me to go back, and I came back. And he came over and he pointed a rifle at me. Oh God! Of course, at that time I didn't realize that, but now. I realized how my mother must have felt. Mm -hmm. But finally, you know, uh, we were, the, the trucks came in, flatbed trucks, and uh, we, we, we were loaded on, on, on them, and they took us away from, Pol from Polsk. We didn't know where we were going. 
or why we, or we we knew why, but we didn't know where. And we wound up after a long, long trek in rain and sleet and all that uh, up in East Prussia, which was north of Poland. It was it was way north of you know our place. This was our first two nights that we spent outside of our home. And it was the most notable thing for uh, humiliation and cruelty that I can think of, considering all the other cruelties that I've witnessed. We were housed for two nights in a big, in, it, was, it, it was either a school or uh, a camp, it was some kind of a campus. Mm -hmm. uh, it might, might be college because it was big. Mm -hmm. And on the floor, there was no, there were classes, the, the, the classrooms were open, but there were no chairs, no uh, tables, just straw that we could lie on. Mm -hmm. And I forgot to mention to you that uh, the 4,000 Jews from Plotsk, we were divided in groups. Mm -hmm. So our group of about eight to 600 people were sent to this particular place in East Prussia called the city of called Zoldau. How, how do you spell that? S-O-L-D-A-U, Zoldau. Okay. As a matter of fact, this city, I don't know if you happen to, there was a movie um, Valkyrie, the other, uh, a, a, a movie was just made, Valkyria, mm -hmm. about the assassination of Hitler and all that. Mm -hmm. And that, sh there was something about Zoldau, I know that. But anyhow, so we were housed there for two days. So the class were, were open, uh, classrooms were open, but the restrooms were closed. And that was, of course, up, uh, north, of, uh, north of Poland, uh, uh, Polish border. Uh, the East Prussia was uh, the almost, you know, uh, very north. It was freezing. It was still sleet and everything. There was a uh, soccer field that was frozen. It was maybe was made a, a, into a skating ring or something. And that's what everybody who had to uh, uh, have biological function, function, they had to relieve themselves right there in open. Mm -hmm. So this was the first humiliation that I remember mm -hmm. out of many humiliation that were to come later. Mm -hmm. But this was the first one. For whatever reason, well, of course we still didn't know where we were going, mm -hmm. you know, they put us on a train. On a regular train, it was not uh, one of those cattle trains that we know. But, and we were heading south. Mm -hmm. I remember that the train stopped at Warsaw. Mm -hmm. And I looked out, and I was never in a big city outside mm -hmm. of Płock, you know, at that time. I was, as a matter of any city except one, uh, down uh, maybe three, 25 miles from us. For a day or so, but I was never out of Płock, and here I was in Warsaw, and we started, uh, we stopped at the railroad station, and I was saying to myself, oh my God, wouldn't it be something if I could go out if we <coughs> and could see our ta uh, father? Mm -hmm. Of course, we were not allowed to leave. The train must have been sealed, and we went after this stop. They unloaded us uh, south of Warsaw, way south of Warsaw. And then once we embarked the uh, train, we were we were transported by um, wagons, uh, 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 horse and uh, horse and buggy? 
Okay. Yes, uh, you know, th this kind of transportation. Mm -hmm. Wagon driven, ho uh, horse driven wagons, let's mm -hmm. put it this way here. Mm -hmm. And uh, our, again, our groups was, were d was divided the, because of the, on the train was about five, 800 people. So maybe three or four hundred of us landed in a little place. I don't know what they call village, hamlet, uh, uh, named Bodzentin, B O D Z E N T Y N, and we were dumped, so to speak, on a Jewish population maybe of hundred families. Did you know most of the people? Pardon me. Did you know most of the people who were traveling with you? No, I mean, as a kid, I well, neighbors and so on, but we knew them by name. My mother probably knew them. My mm -hmm. some of the sisters did, but mm -hmm. I, I, you know, if they were my friends, yes, there were, there were three or four of them uh, that were my friends, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, uh, them I I knew, but uh, that was about mm -hmm. all I, knew, all the people I knew, and. Uh, that's where the hell broke loose. Mm -hmm. There were two rich Jewish families in that particular city. They were trying to help us, but the rest of them were what I think impoverished Jews. In Jewish language, we refer to this uh, to this uh, location as a shtetl. Mm -hmm. It's a small little town, mm -hmm. uh, and these people were just overwhelmed with our arrival, as we were overwhelmed with what what we saw. Mm -hmm. There was lot. Uh, we were housed in what that was previously their storefronts. For example, on this one street uh, that uh, we lived, where in Bozentin, in that one storefront, there were three families. We had four cots, you know, mm -hmm. again straw burlap, you know, filled straw, straw burlap, burlaps filled with straws. Mm -hmm. I believe in this hour store front that we lived was a little cubicle that had a toilet. Mm -hmm. That's about it. We had no facilities to drink anything. We had no facilities to take a bath. And of course, with that was lack of sanitation. Mm -hmm. If you combine this with lack of food, mm -hmm and a terror mm -hmm. that go went with it. I don't know what was the, what the worst, whether it was the hunger or the epidemic. We were covered with lice. Mm -hmm. And I mean covered, literally speaking. We could not, the lice were just crawling. These were the types, we call it the clothing li uh, lice, because I know even in this country, uh, people, uh, there, are su there is such a thing as uh, uh, head lice, mm -hmm. but you know, it's it's nothing serious because it can be, you know, if you have the medication and all that, you can get rid of it. These were what they call clothing lice, that were in our clothing, in the seams of our clothing, and it was impossible to get rid of them, mm -hmm. unless killing them, and there were thousands in between our. Uh, nails, uh, fingernails, there was nothing we could do about it. The problem is compounded by the, was compounded by the fact that they spread typhus. Mm -hmm. Typhus, of course, now is uh, almost eradicated, but whenever it strikes, it's deadly. And even if there is medical help, you know, uh, but of course we had no medical help. So 
who were decimated in this particular town with by typhus and by hunger. Okay. If people did not, if people did not die from typhus, they died from hunger. Did you get? Did peop Did you get any food? I mean, what? We we were there was a uh, a kitchen, a communal kitchen that the Germans uh, uh, established, and we had these. Uh, every family, head of the family, in case my wife. It was my mother uh, had a utens uh, uh, a, a pitcher, you know, it was an earthenware pitcher. I still remember the pitcher, and people were uh, trying to get as big a pitcher as possible because they felt, you know, if the big pitcher, the soup, that was soup, <laughs> it was a euphemism for water, <laughs> actually, or vice versa. There was nothing there. Uh, we would line up over there. And it would be ladled out, you know, whoever, if it was, in our case, was four of us, you get four ladle of that supposedly soup. It was water that was uh, boiled. Uh, maybe there were, I, I don't know exact measurements, but just to give you an idea, if there was 20 gallons of water in this big kettle, maybe they put one pound of potatoes. Mm -hmm. And the potatoes, you know, got to a point where they were completely mushed together. Mm -hmm. And this was the thing. There was no nutrients in it. Mm -hmm. There was no caloric values. So as a result, there was widespread hunger. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, we were helped by some of the locals. The most amazing thing is, and today when I was waiting for you, I did my thing that I've been doing it for the last five years. When this business, was, this uh, museum was established, I know this is a side story, but okay. you might be interested to know. Uh, <clears throat> I just happened to be looking at the library that was very small, you know, now of course with quite a few books, but it was maybe one, two shelves, and just by coincidence, there was a little book, yellow covers this big. Coincidences always happen to me. Why? The book, lo and behold, was about Bozentin. Mm -hmm. And how we, the refugees, were thriving in Bozentin. The picture of Bozentin was comparable to what you see now in Darfur, or used to see in Biafra, you see in Rwanda, I mean health-wise and hunger-wise. Mm -hmm. And here I see this book. I remember when I got home, I was stupefied, and I called up. Remember I told you there was one friend of mine who was in Bozentin with me? Mm -hmm. He's still in California. And I told him of the book. Mm -hmm. And he says, oh, come on, you can't, you're just telling your story. You're lying. I said, no, it is. A couple of weeks later, I went back to get the book. I cannot find it. It's there somewhere. Mm -hmm. I was hoping that maybe one of these days there will be some bibliography that will say a book such as the Bozentin, you know, and I'll give, but Today, as a matter of fact, I came in ahead of you, about mm -hmm. half an hour, mm -hmm. and I was looking right there. And you didn't find it? No. Maybe you and I can look together and find well, it. It's just... Do I you think, remember anything about the book? I, I, I think, of course, but my memory has failed me before. It was a small book like this, mm -hmm. uh, paper, uh, paperback, and I think the cover was yellow. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at the yellow everything, but who knows? But anyway, it was such a shock. And they mentioned a family over there, Schechter family. This was one of the rich families. When I saw this, it was thriving or something to the effect, you know. I said, oh my God. 
Did you, could you tell who wrote the book? Was no, it a German? I or no, it was somebody, and I think at that time I was so shocked that I, there was some Jewish survivor or somebody from New Jersey. He was in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. But I cannot offer you any more, mm -hmm. and I'll tell you, of course, it is a Sisyphus work, you know, I cannot <laughs> do anything about it anymore. But every time you know, I come to this place, and I come very, very often, I'm drawn to the library because I figured maybe I'll find it. Mm -hmm. But I, 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 but this is a size thing, but okay. anyhow, How this, is, this is an example of, you ca sometimes you cannot uh, believe what you read or something, what was the <laughs> saying, you know. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, you wanted to ask me something? That's okay. I just wondered, how long were you in this town? I, I would say in Bozentin we were um, uh, probably okay. Uh, probably okay. We came in in winter time, uh, not quite a year. Okay. Or maybe, maybe a year. Mm -hmm. Was there a winter? Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. W w a year and a half. Year a and year and a half. half. Because that's right, a year and a half. Because we 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 had one winter over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did you spend your time there? Trying to disinfect ourselves, trying to get rid of the lies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was uh, I was hired. I hired myself. Uh, to bury people who were uh, uh, dying from hunger, those. so I would uh, dig graves, uh, dig graves from them. Uh, it was nothing. It was, it was just absolute helplessness. Mm -hmm. And I told you about another thing. There are cer certain things that are so etched in my memory, or maybe in my sense of smell, mm -hmm. rather than memory. Mm -hmm. We were, we were restricted to this one um, street. You know, it was, of course, it was a ghetto, but without a wall. And uh, there was a bakery somewhere on the outskirts of this thing. Mm. And the smell. The fresh baked bread when it was when it wafted in mm -hmm. it was just the most mm -hmm. excruciating thing I can only compare from what I read and from what I know about narcotics narcotic mm -hmm. agents uh, uh, addicts you know how they crave a mm -hmm. fix you know, they don't know, they just get out of the mind, especially if it's hard narcotics like co cocaine or, uh, you know, whatever it's there. That's how we felt. Mm -hmm. So when you ask me what we did, I don't know whether we were just spending the time dreading the time when the smell of the bread will come. And that was just but nothing, waiting f from uh, to get, you know, the, during the midday when my mother had to go and get that uh, soup mm -hmm. that was rationed to us. Did you, you just got that one time a day? Or? One time a day, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was just, oh yeah, it was, and it was a piece of bread or something uh, for everybody, you know, but it was just. But uh, this was the extent of our life, complete. And when I, when the people ask me, of course, then of course I will be telling you about when, I, when we went to, when we landed in Warsaw. If anything, of course, uh, the the, the uh, Warsaw ghetto and large ghettos like in large, uh, large, large Polish cities, primarily Warsaw is uh, symbolic of the suffering, of the hunger, and of the disease, and of the brutality. I think that 
the life in those small things matched brutality for brutality, hunger for hunger, disease, disease, with anything that was happening in a larger ghetto. Mm -hmm. Maybe more so because in a Warsaw ghetto, as I will tell you later, th there was some help, self-help, that carried over from before the war. In these small ghettos, there was nothing. There was just unmitigated brutality and hunger and death. Especially, it was so vivid in my memory, because later in Warsaw, of course, I was in the Varsovian. You know, I was I was born in Polsk, but in this. Uh, Bozentin that I'm telling you about it, I knew people. Mm -hmm. I knew our teachers, our doctors, our, uh, you know, uh, people, notables that we looked up to. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to, in good times, uh, we had the uh, benefit of their sometimes, you know, largesse, sometimes, you know, of friendship. Now we saw them skeletons, mm -hmm. or maybe before even they were skeletons, they were reduced to just, they were eviscerated of every human uh, attribute. Mm -hmm. And this was very painful to see. Mm -hmm. Before even I buried them, you know, with this, uh, in this little cemetery that Bless you. Thank you. So uh, th that what we that was was our life in this particular little town. Okay. I might also mention to you that there was no because I mentioned you see as I talk to you, you know certain things come to my mind. I mentioned brutality. Uh, right now I mentioned to you that's all I did is uh, the hunger in the epidemic. There was no German garrison in this particular town. But there were the garrison that was, that uh, the town was serviced, so to speak, by the garrison from a little town, Bielani, which was about 25, 30 miles away. But once a week, the gendarmes from that other place came in to Budzentin. Mm -hmm. And it was a day of carnage. Nobody dared to go on a street when three or four gendarmes came in on this particular day. One of them, one, the name of one of them was Goebbels. I don't mm -hmm. think it was a relation, but he which was very unusual, he had a lame leg. And you know, in Germany, you know, if you were handicapped or something, you were persona non grata, you, mm -hmm. sometimes you were relegated to, you know, lower class and all that. But he was very valuable to them. He was a born killer. And when he, when he came into our town, We knew somebody was getting killed, mm -hmm. one or two people. And you know, it was a small town, so when two people get killed, you know, Rosa. I was telling you, I remember when uh, this uh, German soldier uh, pointed a rifle at me. There was a very similar, maybe, of course, worse situation with this Goebbels. You know, I was, because I was maybe not smart, or I was, it carried over from my prankster life, you know, before the war. I was happy-go-lucky. I, I didn't know half the time what I was doing. And when 
Gebus and his guys came to town, all we had to do, we just were, the storefront, of course, had windows, so we were constantly looking at the, uh, the street. I don't know what made me jump out, out of the, uh, we were, we were al allowed to walk in the street because it was within the ghetto uh, area, mm -hmm. but not when Goebbels was in town. He spotted me. Cool. And my mother was at the window, you know. She saw that. Mm -hmm. And he uh, took me by the collar and he's pushing, uh, taking, uh, pushing me somewhere. Around the corner was a bar, a, a restaurant, a bar really. On occasions I used to go to this bar and this woman allowed me to clean things, help her and all that. So she knew. Mm -hmm. It was an afternoon, I think, and the door opens to the thing, and she sees Gables comes in with me over there. And without any, you know, uh, further ado, so to speak, he takes out his pistol. As I say, I was stupid, go lucky. I don't think I, I realized what was happening, but she did, you know, the owner of this. Uh, Mr. Bielanska, and she was must have been petrified because she knew what was coming, and she came out from behind the bar, and jokingly, she said to him, "Hey, what are you going to do? I just had my." F uh. mm. I just had my floor cleaned. Mm. And he had one of his hand on me. I was. And she said to him, "Come on, get a drink. Get this and get the and to me, get the hell out!" And she kicked me. Wow. When I. When I got back, I got a beating from my wife, from my mother, <laughs> mm -hmm. because she saw that. Mm -hmm. Can we stop here? Sure. For a little bit. Okay.